Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Welcome back to Slam Dance 2021 virtually. And today we're talking about the narrative feature, The Sleeping Negro, with the writer, director, and star of the film, Skinner Myers. Thank you for being here, Skinner. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we'd love to uh, have you tell our audience what this film is about. Yeah, so the film is a part essay, part chamber drama about a Black man who is realizing that his whole way of thinking of his positionality in America has been wrong. And he has a couple of racist incidents with an old Black friend, a white fiance, himself. And he's starting to realize, like, he has to start changing the way he thinks about things. Um, and, and so, and try to find his own humanity and rediscover his humanity again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, wow. I, you know, I haven't seen a film quite like this, uh, really impactful. And, you know, we, we talk to independent filmmakers all the time that say, you know, they may not have had the big budget to make mm-hmm. the film, but they made it the way they wanted to. Yeah. And that's the whole time I was watching it. I just, I felt that with your film. I felt like you were just kind of like, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> this, I'm going to write it the way I want. Yeah. I'm going to shoot it yeah. the way I want. And I, I really felt that the whole time I was watching it. So, you know, we, we like to glamorize that. And of course yeah. it's commendable, but it, it's hard to make a film that way and as an independent filmmaker. So can you talk about your process and just really releasing that fear to just put out what you wanted to put out? Yeah, hundred percent. So I was having a really rough year trying to make a feature. I was trying to sell some TV shows. I was trying to find my way in this business. I've been at it for 20 years. I'm a film professor at LMU. I'm in my office here on campus. And I was trying to figure out what could I do for cheap I was an actor back in the day in New York City. I was like, I'll put myself in it, get some friends in it, and um, just express this frustration and anger I was feeling. And so I started watching a lot of films where there were one actor, and I just started writing stuff down. And as I was putting it together, I was like, you know what? Uh, no one's probably going to want to help me make this. It's a very personal film. And I know people, it's not for everybody, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I was trying to poke the bear, white supremacy, and really antagonize um, power structures and systems that uh, black people have been subjugated by in this country. And so when I initially started to put together, I was like, I'm gonna make this for, you know, five grand and just self-finance it. And I told everyone that uh, the budget wasn't much more than that, but it did grow a little bit. And I was able to get some help from some friends, but, you know, we shot this thing in eight and a half days over a three month period. And we only had about six or seven hours to shoot each day. So. I had to be very precise in how I was going to put it together, but it was honestly, I was just sick and tired of um, the co-opting of uh, black stories, black cinema, black messages by Hollywood or people who are trying to assimilate and make black cinema palatable for the masses. And I just wanted to do something that was just like a big middle finger to everybody. And it's funny too, because, you know, it's, there's a lot of people who, who dig the film and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And there's some people who, hate the movie. And some of the people who hate the movie um, are not black. And so when they critique it, it's like, well, I don't approve of this way uh, of this black expression. If you want black expression, then you should watch this. Mm. And it just goes back yeah. down to like the mentality, like why our institutions that we are raised in, our environment, whether we want to realize it or not, um, pushes white supremacist ideologies on us. And we have to unlearn and work hard to undo um, that Americanness. And so it's, uh, but that's a discussion that I was hoping the film would bring out. So, you know, it's a love hate type of thing, like, uh, and do the right thing. Spike Lee, love hate, you know? Mm-hmm. But it was, uh, I was angry and I'm still angry, but it, you know, it was, um, I knew like for the first one, I just had to do it the way I wanted so I could present myself in a way, like if you want to, work with me in the industry this is what I'm da- what I'm about so if you're down let's, let's collab if not then at least you know um where I'm at you know as an artist yeah 
Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's coming in. Um, you know, I was reading through your WeFunder. So you, you did do um, a, a, a crowdfunding. Um, we go tried, ahead. We tried to do WeFunder. We actually uh, stopped it before we took any donations. So it wasn't well, successful. Okay. Well, yeah. we can talk about that too, because <laughs> Ange and I have done that. And yeah, yeah. we can relate. <laughs> okay, Very cool. relatable. We understand. Yeah. But there is a lot of fruitful information in there. And I was reading through some of your statements. Um, but also, um, where was I going with that? I'm so sorry. So I'm you sorry. you were, <laughs> no, it's okay. You're crowdfunding. <laughs> but also, um, while watching the film, I was like, man, some of this is feeling very, um, very much like a play, which yep. I loved. It was very yep. intimate, um, especially with you and the friend. And I want to talk about that because you highlight that in, in the WeFunder description um, and, and talking about that part of the script and, and coming up with that. Yes, that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So when I first thought of this idea, I was like, oh, this could be a really good play. And I thought about making it into a play, but at the same time, yeah. I was like, I, I want to make a film. And plays have been made into films in the past. I knew because of the lack of resources that I had, it was going to be di dialogue driven. Um, and so I just figured like, OK, let me try to find a visual style that uh, will elevate um, it from just being two people sitting down. And if everything was like just two people talking for the whole movie, I was like, that wouldn't be effective. Now, I wanted that for the conversation between the friend. Um, but I was really trying to coordinate the camera moves with the other scenes because they were dialogue heavy. They were very, very dialogue heavy. But when I said earlier, it was a ch part chamber drama, you know, I knew going in, the cr one critique of the script was like, hey, this is a lot of dialogue. It feels like a play. I'm like, well, yeah, it is. And I'm gonna try to present it as best as I can as a film. Um, and some people can't get down with that. You know, I think some people have a, have a particular way of how they think movies should be. And, I, and again, that goes back to white supremacy in terms of our beauty standards, in terms of all these different things. And I'm trying to present something that doesn't exist in any of those standards. And that's a hard pill to swallow for people who think they know what cinema should be, right? Or they think they know what art should be. And, um, and so when it came to having all the dialogue, I was like, all right, let me just try to find the beats that I feel like um, I can work with to, to you know to to visually uplift what i was saying so i knew going in it was going to be dialogue driven i mean there was days we had to shoot 15 pages in one day mm. um but part of that too going back it's like the resources marginalized communities black and brown people don't have control of the means of production we don't have the freedom like freedom is having an idea and being able to actualize it we have ideas but we can't actualize it because we don't control mm. our structure so part of the aesthetic of the film is a result of the lack thereof of power to be able to create the film that I really wanted to make, right? Not being able to get the, the money that I needed, having a limited amount of time, relying on kind-hearted people to give me free locations, stealing locations. Um, so <laughs> when we look at films and we have to take all that into consideration, and what happens is that people tend to judge films on a Hollywood three-act Eurocentric structure and that's just not the type of stuff that I'm interested in. I have friends in that system and that's fine. But for me and what I was trying to do with this piece um, was express visually what I, the mental gymnastics that one has to do to maintain their sanity under white supremacy. Now, I do it for the community. If black people are feeling it, not everyone's gonna feel it, but mostly black and brown people are feeling it, then cool, because I wanna try to put out there uh, emotions and feelings that maybe other marginalized people are feeling, right? If white people aren't down with it, it ain't for it ain't for them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So yeah. I don't need your validation. I don't need that permission to f to feel validated for what I'm trying to say. Um, I think we've lost the way we've lost the ability the ability to critique art in America. Um, everything's commodified. Everything's mm. profit driven. Um, and that is, that's a big problem. So people are growing up thinking that uh, we can only consume art, a certain, a certain type of art, only consume, consume, consume. And so um, I'm expecting, I mean, I call it like black phobogenic cinema, antagonistic cinema. I'm expecting a lot of um, 
extreme responses to the movie. I don't, you know, I don't really expect anyone to be like, ah, oh, it was okay. It's either they're going to hate it for either art uh, creative reasons, they're going to hate it for um, the subject, or they're going to they're going to love it. You know, and but that's art should. I think art should create an ex an extreme uh, emotion out of one. You know, it's not it's not just about escapism. You know, because what white supremacy wants to do is say, you know what? Yes, you're being subjugated. But how about that that black joy? Or how about um, representation? Right? Aren't you happy about that? Don't worry that you're being screwed over. But you, you know, you're being represented, or or uh, you should be happy that one of y'all have gotten have been chosen to make money or to mm. be you know so white supremacy plays both sides you know it mm. plays both sides so um i don't know i mean I, those are a lot of things that i'm trying to uh attack and I talk about in my work and there's not a lot of people who want to support that because if you poke the bear then um <laughs> yeah. you know they want to take you out look at all the people who've been assassinated by our government yes yes um, I, a footnote to this too, and, and what you wrote on um, We Funder and Angel, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. And I just wrote it down. And I'm like, God, maybe I should get this as a tattoo, but <laughs> just to like make it real permanent, right? <laughs> you wrote, was America ever created for people of color? No. And I'm like. Not at all. <laughs> no, and this, and this film reflects that question. No. No. So no. yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And listen, I mean, I'm anyone, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but not every, like, I don't really care for opinions that perpetuate um, white supremacist ideologies. And some people won't even realize they're doing it just because oh, yeah. of the institutions that have created, like we're, we create shitty Americans. We create shitty white people. If, the, if, if, if we were actually making advances based on all the civil rights and all the movements and, and the protests, we would be in a very, a much better position as Americans as a whole in terms of equality and justice, but we're not. So that says a lot about our institutions that create us, you know? Um, and we have to start really having those hard conversations, you know what I'm saying? Because just because someone's represented that has the same skin, because just because you, your skin folk, I mean, your kin folk, there's a lot of grifters out there. Mm -hmm. or who are taking the road of let me just make money and let me not worry about the struggle but guess what the future generations are going to be in the same struggle and i care about the future generations like it may not happen in my lifetime but what are we doing as artists as humans as americans to make america actually reach its potential because right now it ain't it ain't and it hasn't no. mm -mm. you know so that that those are where a lot of my frustrations come from um and it, it, it's going to take a coalition. It's going to take a coalition of all kinds of people who are willing to have those hard conversations. We, this country hasn't even tried to have those hard conversations. It sweeps it under the rug. It gaslights. You know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really frustrating. I'm getting a lot of love from the international community. And I think it's because one of the reasons may be, you know, they still really appreciate art for art's sake. There's funds that will fund mm -hmm. cinema with no intention of it making any money because it's like, this is good for the culture. Right. We have nothing like that in America. Here mm -hmm. it has to, if it doesn't entertain, if it doesn't wow you every second of the way, it's, it's horrible. Like it, I'm into slow cinema. You know, I guarantee you a lot of people are like, if they watch slow cinema, like, yo, this is boring, what's the point? And um, I'm not expecting everyone to be deep thinkers to appreciate art, but it's like, there's more than just like, the American way of doing things. This whole exceptionalism thing drives me. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's bullshit. Go ahead, Ange. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, honestly, I just want you to keep talking, Skitter. I feel like I'm going <laughs> to I'm, I'm gonna listen to this interview again and just take yep. notes because I'm really trying to soak in everything you're saying. And, and thank you so much for being so open with us. And, and um, I want to say, like, yes, it, it does feel like a play. But visually, we have to talk about, I mean, it's, it's just shot. You shot on film. It's yeah. so beautifully shot. I, I really feel like it doesn't happen often when you don't really know what you're going to see next. Yep. Um, I, I think you do a really great job of putting us in that position of this character who's processing all these things. It's like, you feel like you're in his mind with him as yep. he's just taking everything in, but, but it's, uh, you know, you're not offering any sort of 
answers per se. You're just kind of putting us in that position with him. Yeah. And I just wanted to talk about, you know, through the process of making this film, what you've taken from your experience. And, you know, you, you had that rage when you wrote it, you still feel that rage, but mm -hmm. I feel like maybe a lot of the answers in how we move forward are going to come with how, how people react to this film. Mm -hmm. And, and how you said, you know, the international, you've gotten a lot of love internationally. It's like, okay, you're down, let's join forces. You know, yeah. this is how we move forward. Yeah. I, I feel like the reaction is gonna be really telling. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I think, um, look, I mean, I'm all about working with people who wanna, who wanna do the work, um, who wanna make things better, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like, I mean, it's, I'm a, I'm, I'm a different person than I was when I wrote the script two and a half years ago, right? Cause I'm we're constantly changing. We're, I'm trying to imp unlearn things and improve my awareness of what's going on globally and how that fits into the history of this country and other countries and subjugated countries. And so um, visually, like I love shooting on film just because it challenges me and it keeps me on my toes. Um, I think there's, you know, there's nothing wrong shooting digitally, but I, I just love film and it, it makes it that much more special for me to to want to make movies um, or, or, or cinema. Uh, but, you know, visually, I was, I was trying out things too, right? I was trying out things because I've only been at the filmmaking thing for about 10 years. I made my first um, a, a film in like 2011, made a whole bunch of shorts. Uh, I was a musician before that. I was an actor before that. And there's a lot of different things in the arts that I'm interested in. You know, I just finished my first novel that I hope will find a home uh, soon. I'm, I want to write more books. Um, I want to spend more time mentoring others like I have you know a handful of films that I've already written that I would love to make after that I don't know if I want to keep making films forever because one it's expensive it's hard and um again the people who control the power dictate whether um it gets seen or not right and so uh but with visually I was trying out things I have some favorite filmmakers like Andre Tarkovsky, Bill Attar, um Jabril uh Diop Mambeti and you know, some people may rag on it visually, but for me, I was just like, okay, let me try some new things. Let me stretch. You're not going to grow unless you try things that are scary. And it's, it's very, you know, I, I don't, I'm not planning on acting in everything that I make, but I acted in it. I wrote it. I directed it. Um, you know, it's, it's me completely naked. And I mean, sometimes people don't realize what goes into making art or making film. Um, because if you, if you say, okay, I would love, like take a script, here's some money and a camera, take an idea you love and go make it and, and let's talk about it. Um, and so I hadn't done that in a long time. Ever since I was a musician, I hadn't really put myself out there. Because as, as a musician, I write the song, I do the music, I'm singing, I'm live. If the crowd doesn't clap, it's like, okay, didn't like that. All right, if they clap and scream, you're like validation. And we all want to be validated as, as humans. You know what I'm saying? Um, we all want to be hugged and touched and, and felt like our lives are important. Um, so I was trying to do interesting things that kept people on their toes. Um, you know, it's funny that the scene where I have a fight with my white fiance <laughs> and I'm on the toilet. Yes. Table. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. The, I was the, gonna bring that up. Please, thank you for <laughs> please. The, yes. the, the response to that has been split. Some people are like, what the fuck? Like that's such a weird creative choice. Why would you do that? It's so bad, it's horrible. Other people are like, yo, that's deep, that's brilliant. And for me, I was like, I one, I've had fights like that. I've had fights where um with my wife where it's like you're you're so close with each other it's like you're doing multiple things as you're yeah. bringing up old things. So like for me, it was like, this is very real. For some people, it's like, no, this is not plausible. This is not believable. This would never happen. And you're kind of and like, they're trying to dictate what would be a normal uh, relationship. And again, it goes back to what kind of films have they consumed? What has been taught to them in terms of how relationships operate? And so that was one choice that I made that I was like, this, would th this is going to throw it off. The dude's vulnerable. Like he's literally taking a shit. He's vulnerable. And the argument is getting heated to a point where I don't think either one of them thought uh, it would go. Plus, he's an asshole. I, the, the character is an asshole. And I made him an asshole because life ain't black and white. We are complicated people. Human, to be contradictory is to be human. So it wasn't like, oh, feel bad for the black dude or um, oh, just, you know, recognize me, recognize my pain. 
and that's it and do nothing is like we're all a product of our environment we can all be assholes but look at the system of what it's creating and, and the struggles and the, and the mental issues that it's creating and what are the choices we make after something like that happens how do we deal with white supremacy in our lives um you know how do we fight the system? How do we still maintain a livelihood? How do we put food on the table for our families? Um, you know, no one wakes up and says, you know, I, I just want to be assassinated at like 25, you know, but we're fighting for a better future, but we still have to live in today. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find ways visually, um, dialogue wise, performance wise, emotionally to constantly mix it up. It's like jazz. Right, and and and, and I want to make it clear that I'm, the movie is not above um, critique at all, right? Um, it's one thing to critique a film and have a conversation and argue points. I, mean, I don't think we do that a lot in art. We don't argue uh, in a good Productively, way. Productively, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's just one thing to shit on it because it doesn't fit your ideology of what cinema should be, you know. Um, but. Uh, I was just trying to, I was trying different things. You know, this is my mm -hmm. first feature. I had eight and a half days. I had <laughs> seven hour shooting days. I didn't have any money. Right. And we were shooting on film. I did mainly one take for everything, except for a couple of scenes. We did two or three takes. It was wow. really one take film. I had to pre-edit the film as we were setting up the shot list because I was like, well, we're not gonna have time to get all this coverage. Mm -hmm. um, the first version was 83 minutes. We recut it down to 73. I changed up the ending a little bit. I mean, it was like, it, cause it kind of is what it is, but I was trying to, again, present it as an essay, like uh, dipping into jazz. Like what can I do to make it seem like something that no one has ever seen? And someone, you're either gonna see value in that or, or you're not, you know what I'm saying? And for me, it's like, okay, yes, I have to talk about this movie, but I'm ready to present something else that talks about a different aspect of, uh, of our lives, you know? Um, so that, those are the attempts I was doing. And so, you know, there's been a lot of love for the film and I appreciate it, but we'll see what happens. You know, it's, um, we definitely have gotten, uh, we've been reached out to by some distributors, which is great, but we're still in the very beginning process of the whole, this is our first festival, this is our first festival. You know, we have another year, uh, the rest of the year to, to play festivals and, um, uh, so I'm interested to see what's going to happen overall, but I just want to be able, like, as marginalized people, it's like, give me the money and step out of the way versus giving the money and dictate or yeah. co-opt my message so that mm -hmm. it's palatable and that you don't get offended. You know what I'm saying? Like, white supremacy, white supremacy has put whiteness, and when I say whiteness, I mean an impoverished idea of what freedom is. Mm. All right? I'm not talking about... Um, white people individually, it, you know, uh, there's anti-blackness and there's white supremacy. You can be black and brown and still have anti-blackness sentiments towards your own people, mm -hmm. have self-hatred. Like Malcolm X said, who taught you to hate yourself? Who taught you to hate your hair? Who taught you to hate, hate the, the, the shape of your nose, right? So um, it's like, how do we, I'm trying to figure out how to use art to like spur those conversations, but one, it's expensive and it takes forever. Yeah. So it's not the most efficient way. And it is a petite bourgeoisie thing to do. Right? So it's like, okay, this is one aspect of me, but I'm trying to figure out in my 40s now, like, am I doing enough? To, I mean, you know, obviously we're in the pandemic, but like, am I doing enough tangibly on the ground to help people that I can help? I mean, I'm handicapped with uh, student loan debt. I got 300, uh, well, 384,000 now. It was way higher than that. But it's like, I got to manage that. People don't, see, people don't really think about all the things that one may have to deal with. Mm -hmm. I, I am a slave to debt. I am no different than someone who's making seven bucks an hour who, 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 who doesn't know if they're going to be able to, if they get sick, if their job is going to fire them. You know what I'm saying? Um, if I lose my job as a teacher, that $385,000 ain't going away. Right. You know what I'm saying? If if the, you know if uh, Hollywood says, "Here, Skinner, here's five million dollars. Go make, um, you know, X film part 10. <laughs> right. That's not who I am, and I'm not going to do that. But you see, white supremacy 
feeds you these lies that, hey, get, I mean, I went to Columbia University. I got a master's in uh, politics at Brooklyn College, and I went to USC. It was like, at one point, I was like, yo, bootstraps. Yeah, let me go to these schools and let me get these degrees. I'm going to get a job, a good paying job. That's the lie. That's, mm-hmm. that's the drift. That's, that's the game they sell you. And so then it's like, oh, hey, what's wrong? You know, um, you know, I can be a professor on the outside, right? I can be a professor, family, two kids, been very blessed in a lot of ways in my life. I've traveled the world. I've made a lot of great friends. I have a lot of great people in my life of all colors, all genders, but I am still a, a slave to the debt. And that is what white supremacy creates. It's this, it's this, uh, fake veneer of like, look, look at this person, they're doing okay. But once you start speaking up of, of, and, and exposing what's really going on, that's when you start to have troubles. That's when you can't sustain yourself. That's when, you, and it, they just double down, double down, double down. Look at all the political prisoners that are still in prison. Look at all the black, mm-hmm. poor black Panthers are still in prison. Mm-hmm. These people ain't dead. Asada Shakur is up in Cuba and they still putting a hit out on her head, like a warrant out for her on some trumped up charges. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if you're willing to fight the system, that's that's like the future that you're looking at as a black and brown person. That's not freedom. This ain't this ain't no freedom. A country founded on genocide and slavery no. is not a country that was that's one that's Christian. White Christianity okay. was a recruiting ground for the KKK, and it still has uh, white supremacist sentiments in that in that section of Christianity. If you look at the Black Liberation theology, that's something different. You know, the funky academic. Uh, talks about it where he says Christ came to deniggerize you. That's not what they, that's not what white Christianity is talking about, right? If your Christianity says, well, your reward's only in heaven, that's white supremacy. This whole patriarchal, patriarchal hierarchical system, that's white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Women stay in the kitchen, birth, have, you know, birth kids. Let the man, let the man take care of it. So these are all the things that you know, as a, if you have any type of sensitivity to what's really going on, it's going to, it's going to affect you. I got a daughter who's mm-hmm. two and a half. I got a son that's seven. You know, when they were born, my kids are half Japanese, half black, but they're going to be seen as black in America, even in Japan too. But, you know, I went, mm-hmm. through a lot of right. guilt. I went through a lot of guilt when I had my children, because I was like, I mean, I love them. And they gave me such a big reason to exist and live. But I was like, I'm bringing in these babies into this world that's so messed up and it's like now they're gonna have to deal with especially when i'm done when i'm gone and i'm not around they're gonna have to deal with it and that really you know i thought about that and that really messed me up for 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 a long time and i was just like i we don't take care of the planet you know what i'm saying and we you know, part of it is like when I see, I expect to get this emotional about it, but part of me is like when I, when I look at lynching photographs, mm. the dehumanization of black people, they took pictures, made them into postcards, right. mm-hmm. and mailed them around openly. When we watch black trauma on TV, people getting a life snuffed out and they're using it as some political ploy to get votes. That upsets me. And if that doesn't upset you as a person, as an American, like what the hell is going on? You know what I'm saying? Like it, that's the, that's the anger and the frustration and the tiredness that I feel constantly. And my experience as a black man is not the same for every black person. I understand that. But I guarantee you more black people feel the way I do than they don't. Whether you're a Trump supporter, whether you love QAnon, whatever it is, it's all because you're trying to deal with the trauma of white supremacy and what it's done to you and your people. You feel me? Like, that's, that's the problem. So as artists, when you put ourselves out there like that, we're trying to bring up these conversations in a different way so people have a different way to think about it. Don't watch the mainstream media. 
That shit is like pre-scripted. But if your heart is not in trying to find justice for people, what is justice is finding the people who need the most help and giving them the most constructive help. Then you you ain't, what are we doing? You know, and, and that's, that's, that's what drives me. That's, that's, that's what for, makes me keep going. And thinking about my kids, it's like, what kind of world are we going to li- live them in? The thought of my son, you know, he loves playing with Nerf guns. I had to tell him, it's like, you, mm. you're not allowed to have that outside. You can get shot by a cop. Why, daddy? Because you're black. They're not going to see your, you as a human first. They're going to see you as a threat first. He's seven years old. At five years old, we had, I had to tell him about Emmett Till. Mm. Up until then, it was like utopia. He goes to like a school and there's all kinds of different colors and, and mixed people. And they, and they all love each other. We, kids are taught hate. That's just perpetuated. Because it's better to divide and conquer so people who are the elites and who are in power can maintain the power. The moment there's any type of mobilization amongst a coalition, look what they did to Fred Hampton. Mm-hmm. He was building a coalition it's called the Rainbow Coalition. Right. So though, and I'm sorry for getting emotional, but those are all those things that, you know, I'm trying to put into the work. And then I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to live in a way where I authentically live in, in my relationships with others. It ain't always about making movies. I don't care about fame. It'd be nice not to have all this debt hanging over my head, but in the end, it ain't going to follow me into death. Like, what am I going to do? What, what kind of legacy am I going to leave behind in terms of how I've dealt with it, my fellow human brother and sister? Like, I don't know. It's, it's just, it, sometimes it feels overwhelming, you know? And honestly, making movies ain't the best, most efficient way to get it out. But occasionally it does help. If you look at the bigger picture, we need all these different things. We need podcasts. We need salons. We need movies. We need music. But we need people brave enough to speak out about the issues when they get a chance. They get a platform because you never know when that platform is going to get snatched away. Because we don't control the means of production. Not enough of us, at least. Segregation should have happened the, the other way, from the top down. You shouldn't put the kids in schools first. Start with the administrators. You work it backwards so that when the kids get there, the foundation is set. You work that shit out up top with, through adults. You don't put that burden on kids. So it's, it just gets me going. And so I, you know, I appreciate people taking the time and watching the movie. It ain't for everybody. People are going to hate it. They're going to shit on it. They're going to love it. They're going to show it a lot of love, but it's like, let's, let's, let's have some, let's have some discourse. Let's have some conversation. You know, if you are, and also too, we have to think about how art is being consumed. We're in a pandemic. People are watching these movies, especially at Slam Dance, on their iPhone or their mm-hmm. iPad or the laptop. We're supposed to watch it in a dark room as a community so yeah. we can feed off each other's energy. So right there off the bat, the way people perceive cinema right now is going to be way different than maybe what it would have been or what it will be once we get back to being able to get together as a community. And I understand that. And it's hard. Um, but those are just some of the things and I appreciate y'all letting me, you know, get some things off my chest, but that's just like where my heart is at. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care what people believe in as long as they're fighting for justice and equality. And we're trying to like, whatever, it doesn't, whatever system it becomes, doesn't need to be having an ism behind it. It just needs to be more equitable and more ju- and, 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 and have more justice for people who are not getting justice. It's not okay that people are are dying. It's not okay that Amazon has ambulances set up outside in the parking lot because it's more cheaper for them to do that than to have a union to pay them a living wage. It's fucked up in this country. And it's like, I don't need any more like, um, oh, well, let us give you someone else. Look at them, they're, you know, let me give you a poet. Let me give you this. Like, how does that change the materialistic conditions on the ground? Mm-hmm. It doesn't. So stop with all the representational bullshit and like get some stuff done. 
Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. But you never have to apologize. You never have just, we just thank you for everything you've shared and, and everything that you're working towards. Um, I, I think your words are so powerful and, and I, I think that um, it was really just an honor to, to hear you speak today and to have you on Bitch Talk. And, and I hope I hope we can, we can connect on future projects yeah. and with future causes. Yeah, um, yeah a, again, we've been speaking to Skinner Myers, uh, director, writer, and star uh, of the narrative feature, The Sleeping Negro. Thank you, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to chat with both of you and I hope to see y'all in person really soon. We do too. <laughs> yeah, take care. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. Mm-hmm.